Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, we will talk about sexual health conditions. Let's begin. Chlamydia is the most common STI caused by infection with chlamydia trachomatis. Patients are usually asymptomatic, although some symptoms that may be experienced by female patients include postcoital bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, and mucopyrulent discharge. Males with chlamydia may have urethral discharge or dysuria. Endocervical swabs or vulvovaginal swabs can be done to test for chlamydia in females, whereas for males, the first catch urine sample is usually used. Treatment is with a course of doxycycline. Screening for other STIs should be performed as well as contact tracing. Contacts of confirmed chlamydia cases should be treated even before their test results come back. This is called treat then test. Testing is performed 14 days after sexual contact with an infected person. In the UK, annual opportunistic screening is offered to all sexually active young people 15 to 24 years of age. Complications of chlamydia include PID, tubal infertility, ectopic pregnancy, reactive arthritis and epididymitis in males. Gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. Patients can be asymptomatic, especially if the infection is affecting the rectum or the pharynx. Patients can experience symptoms like dysuria and mucopyrulent discharge from the vagina in females and from the urethra in males, so much like chlamydia. Nucleic acid amplification test and, then if positive, a culture, is done to identify Neisseria gonorrhea and test for sensitivities using a vulvovaginal or endocervical swab in females or a first void urine sample in males. Treatment is with an IM stat dose of ceftriaxone and an oral stat dose of azithromycin to treat for chlamydia as well. Sexual partners should also be treated empirically even before the test results come back, just like chlamydia. A follow-up appointment should be made after one week to confirm resolution of symptoms, adherence to treatment and test of cure. Some complications of gonorrhea include disseminated gonococcal infection, septic arthritis, endocarditis, PID and infertility. Pelvic inflammatory disease or PID is a severe complication of an STI like chlamydia or gonorrhea causing infection and inflammation of the female pelvic organs. Young people, people with a history of STIs, a recent change in sexual partner, that is within the last three months, recent insertion of an intrauterine device or multiple sexual partners are all at increased risk of developing PID. Patients with PID will usually experience lower abdominal pain, deep dyspareunia, and symptoms of the underlying causative infection, like postcoital bleeding or abnormal discharge. Some clinical signs that may be present include cervical excitation, adnexal tenderness, pelvic tenderness, and pyrexia. Some patients may experience pain in the right upper quadrant. Do you know why? Ruck pain can be a sign of Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, which is perihepatitis, and it's a complication in about 10% of cases of PID. Some other complications of PID include ectopic pregnancy, infertility, and chronic pelvic pain. Any woman of childbearing age with lower abdominal pain should get a pregnancy test to rule out ectopic pregnancy as the first investigation. High vaginal and endocervical swabs should be done to screen for sexually transmitted infections and find the causative organism to guide the management plan. Treatment is with analgesia and a combination of ceftriaxone, doxycycline and metronidazole. STIs picked up on STI screening should also be treated. Contact tracing is essential to prevent the spread of infection and this is commonly done by the gum team. Current sexual partners would be contacted and offered screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Can you think of some differential diagnoses for pelvic inflammatory disease?
Some differential diagnoses include pregnancy, ruptured ectopic pregnancy, appendicitis, endometriosis, ovarian cyst torsion or rupture, and UTI. Human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is a retrovirus that infects and destroys immune cells, in particular the CD4 cells. It can be spread horizontally, that is sexually, or by inoculation in IV drug users, in blood or blood products, or by getting a tattoo using unsterilized equipment. And it can also be spread vertically, that is from mother to child. Some risk factors for contracting HIV are IV drug use, being a commercial sex worker or having sex with a commercial sex worker, getting a tattoo abroad, men who have sex with men, and maternal HIV. Factors that reduce vertical transmission include maternal antiretroviral therapy, delivery of the child by caesarean section rather than vaginally if the viral load is high, treatment of the neonate with antiretrovirals, and avoiding breastfeeding. About 3 to 12 weeks after infection, patients usually develop a long-lasting glandular fever type illness. This is called HIV seroconversion. Other symptoms of HIV infection include diarrhea and lymphadenopathy. HIV may be picked up incidentally in advanced stages if patients present with complications like AIDS, immunosuppression, Kaposi sarcoma or pneumocystis gerevechi infection. If someone has been exposed to HIV but is asymptomatic, testing for HIV should be done at four weeks after possible exposure, and if this test came back negative, then the test is repeated again at 12 weeks. Anyone potentially exposed to HIV should be urgently given post-exposure prophylaxis. Antiretroviral therapy is a combination of drugs that is used in the treatment of HIV and is very successful once patients are compliant with the treatment regime. Patients with HIV on antiretrovirals usually have a very, very good prognosis. Syphilis is an infectious disease caused by trepanoma pallidum. It can be passed on horizontally or vertically. Syphilis occurs in three stages. Initially, a painless ulcer called a shanka develops at the site of sexual contact and there is local lymphadenopathy. If primary syphilis is left untreated, 25% will develop secondary syphilis, about 4-10 to 10 weeks after the initial symptoms. Patients experience a fever, a widespread rash and condylomata lata, which are painless, warty lesions on the genitals. Secondary syphilis resolves within 12 weeks spontaneously. Then the disease becomes latent and patients become asymptomatic. If syphilis is left untreated, then a third of patients will develop late or tertiary disease, up to 40 years after the initial infection. Late disease can cause cardiovascular complications like ascending aortic aneurysms, gummatous complications and neurological complications like Argyle-Robertson pupils. Argyle-Robertson pupils are seen in neurosyphilis and can also be seen in diabetes. The pupils appear small and irregular and although the accommodation reflex is present, pupillary reflex in response to light is absent. Syphilis serology is done to confirm the diagnosis and benzyl penicillin is often used in the treatment. Genital warts are benign lesions caused by HPV infection, especially types 6 and 11. Do you remember what HPV subtypes predispose to cervical cancer? Sixteen, eighteen, and thirty-three. The warts are usually painless, small, and slightly pigmented. They are soft and flat and plaque-like. They are sometimes associated with pruritus. Genital warts can be diagnosed clinically. Rarely, a biopsy may be required to confirm the diagnosis. They can be left alone and managed conservatively, as recurrence is common. If the warts are problematic though, they can be removed using cryotherapy or topical imiquimod second line. Screening for other STIs should be done. It's important to recommend condom use and cutting down on smoking, as smokers respond less well to treatment. The HPV vaccine is offered in the UK to all girls and boys aged 12 to 13 and protects against HPV subtypes 6, 11, 16 and 18. 
Genital herpes is an infection with HSV1 or 2 that causes multiple painful blisters to develop around the genitals. They then burst and leave ulcerated lesions. Acute genital herpes is usually preceded by prodromal symptoms. It's a clinical diagnosis, although a swab of the ulcer base can be done to confirm the diagnosis and to confirm the subtype of HSV. Screening for other STIs may also be appropriate. Management is with oral acyclovir for 5 to 10 days, topical anaesthetic, oral analgesia, and increasing fluid intake to prevent urinary retention, which is a common complication. Saline bathing is also advised to prevent superinfection. If a primary attack of herpes occurs during pregnancy at later than 28 weeks gestation, elective C section at term is advised. Genital herpes can recur as HSV2 stays latent in the local dorsal ganglion until reactivated due to severe stress or immunosuppression. Recurrences usually are unilateral, less severe and short-lived. Trichomoniasis is a sexually transmitted infection caused by Trichomonas vaginalis. Symptoms include frothy yellow offensive discharge, dysuria and pruritus, although patients can be asymptomatic. Males may also experience urethral discharge and dysuria. On a speculum examination, a woman with trichomoniasis may have a strawberry cervix. Investigation is with a high vaginal swab for a female or urethral swab for a male. Screening for other STIs should also be carried out. Management includes treating the patient with a course of metronidazole, written information and advice. Patients should be advised to abstain from sex until they and their partner or partners have completed their course of antibiotics. Next, let's move on to some non-sexually transmitted infections. Bacterial vaginosis is a non-STI that is caused by a reduction of the vaginal pH when anaerobic organisms like Gardnerella vaginalis predominate and lactobacilli are lost. Patients can be asymptomatic or they may have a thin white offensive discharge. Some risk factors for developing BV are use of vaginal products, washes, bubble baths or vaginal douching, being black and being sexually active. If patients are asymptomatic and non-pregnant, then no treatment is needed. Otherwise, oral metronidazole is given. Patients should receive general advice like to avoid vaginal douching and bubble baths. Vulvovaginal candidiasis or genital thrush is inflammation of the vagina and vulva caused by fungal infection, usually with candida. Risk factors for developing genital thrush include being immunocompromised, steroid use, a recent course of antibiotics, pregnancy, diabetes, vaginal douching and use of bubble baths. Women present with white, cottage cheese-like discharge that is non-offensive and associated with pruritus, soreness and superficial dyspareunia. On examination, the discharge may be visible as well as erythema, excoriations and or satellite lesions. Genital thrush is a clinical diagnosis, although if the diagnosis is uncertain, then a high vaginal swab can be done. Treatment is with intravaginal antifungals with or without oral antifungals. Oral antifungals are contraindicated in pregnancy. Modifiable risk factors should also be corrected, like control diabetes. If the patient has recurrent vaginal candidiasis, that is, four or more episodes every year, then check compliance with the previous treatment, make sure the diagnosis is correct, and exclude predisposing factors before considering an induction maintenance regime, that is with daily treatment for a week and then maintenance treatment weekly for six months. So some key points to take home from this talk. Contact tracing is essential for all patients with sexually transmitted infections and this is usually done by the gum team. Sexual intercourse, even with a condom, is to be avoided until both the patient and their partner or partners have completed their course of treatment. Endocervical swabs are done to test for gonorrhea and chlamydia, but high vaginal swabs are done for GBS, BV, TV and candida. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are actually very similar in presentation and usually coincide. The key difference is chlamydia is treated with doxycycline, 
and gonorrhea is treated with azithromycin and ceftriaxone. And lastly, TV and BV are both treated with metronidazole. The difference between the two is that TV is sexually transmitted and BV isn't. And people with TV have a frothy yellow offensive discharge. And people with BV can be either asymptomatic or they can have a white, thin offensive discharge. Thanks for watching.